on media and technology. We have a great panel for you today discussing voice and media publishing and entertainment. First, our keynote speaker, we have Steve Keller. He, as you know, is Steve. There you go. He's a sonic strategy director for Pandora, um, the streaming service and a leading expert in audio branding. Frank Radis. Frank is an Emmy-winning journalist, producer, director, and marketing executive, as well as author and musician. He is an expert in residence for Definition 6 and Vixen Labs. Neela Gollum. Gollum? <laughs> Neela is Comcast Senior Director of Artificial Intelligence Product, where she runs product for X1 Voice. John Myers. He is co-founder and CEO of EarPlay, which makes collaborative software for teams to publish interactive audio experiences. Mark Mesrich, Vice President for Voice Product at Viacom, exploring voice across Viacom's brands like Nickelodeon, MTV, Comedy Central, and ET. And Courtney Bitterly, who is lead of research and development at the New York Times, focusing on how emerging technology and consumer behavior will impact media. So thank you all for coming. Thank you to our panelists for joining us. To start off this morning, I thought that if you could, in whatever order you feel you want to, maybe just going down the row, talk briefly about some of the limitations of voice uh, in your own publications, in your own companies, in your own use cases. Yeah, I can start. I mean, uh, I approach this in my role from my role is R&D, so from a research and development perspective. So we've done a lot of research into consumer behaviors. And I think one of the things that's really challenging with voice is that people don't necessarily have a reminder to use these devices all of the time. So habituation can be really difficult. Um, and I think that people are still learning how to use this technology. You know, when we were doing field research and doing qualitative research with users, we found that a lot of the uses were fairly limited as they stand right now. So people were asking for the weather, they were asking for, they were asking for things like the news, but building that habit of knowing the precise thing to say, it actually takes a lot of reminding. So internally, what we're thinking about is how can we actually take the existing audio products that we have and how can we reinforce those behaviors? So how can we continue to remind people, you know, you not only can ask for the daily on Alexa, but you can also um, ask for, we have a weekly quiz that we provide. So looking for ways that we can actually cross promote off different platforms, I think is one of, one of the challenges, but I'm sure there are lots of others that we'll uncover. Yeah, there's a lot of limitations, obviously, to these voice platforms, but limitations yield creativity, and that's mostly what we think about at Viacom. So I, I try not to get too caught up, caught up in those, but definitely that, just you know, reminding people is definitely one, one key limitation. Uh, having people know in the first place that what you have is out there beyond your own marketing. Obviously, you don't have an App Store GUI, so that becomes sort of a, sort of a challenge as well. But mostly, we just try and think about what we can do within those limitations to build. Yeah, um, so I think uh, that one of the major limitations right now, given that it's very early and that we're talking about interactivity and conversation uh, and that technology is at an early stage, we, we need to find a way to operate at a higher scale. When we think about publishing or media or entertainment in other verticals or other fields, it's not uncommon to think about hours per day put out or many, many, many uh, hours of uh, content per day put out. But when we think about voice right at this stage, we're thinking in a much more limited way, uh, you know, minutes per day, an hour per week, an hour per month, and I think that sort of engagement will help to grow the industry, but the difficulty is that the technology is not quite there. Like we saw with the Alexis announcement yesterday, I think we're gonna see lots, lots more of that, and that's gonna enable the innovations that drive the next couple years. I'll reflect a lot of um, what Courtney said. Um, we see with our X1 voice remote, we see really high engagement with the product today. Um, last year, we had nine billion voice commands, so really, really fantastic use. Um, and we're expecting to exceed that this year. Um, but one of the things that we see is uh, customers tend to say the same thing over and over again. Um, they just don't know all the functionality that's available. And we're investing so much in building fantastic voice commands to help customers really discover content in unique ways. Um, and then later on, the fact that customers don't want to read a manual, they don't want to have to um, read an email, frankly. They just want to intuitively know how to use these products. 
Um, so one of the ways that we're, we're actually uh, addressing this with X1 specifically is uh, we've recently launched a feature called voice suggestions where we're using the fact that we have the largest UI in people's homes, the TV, right in front of them to educate them about the experience, about what they can say. So um, a user can type in CNN into their remote, and then we will surface a voice suggestion to say, hey, try saying CNN into your voice remote in the future. And we're actually seeing really fantastic engagement with this type of feature um, because it's contextually relevant and it's not intrusive to the user. And um, we're in, in expecting to just continue to expand this type, this type of functionality, um, really just educating the users in a non-intrusive way. So uh, I, th I actually take a position that the education is not necessarily just the user, but it's also the company that's creating the product. Uh, and, and that can in some ways be a barrier to entry. What do I mean by that? So a company knows it needs to be in the space, often says, uh, I need to be in this space, go and do something in that space, make it happen for us, and then we're in the voice space without thinking about how simple it must be, whether it's got to be intuitive, whether it's conversational, whether it's got sound design, all that stuff. Doesn't matter. What matters to me is that if you don't know that it's there, then what the hell good is it? And how, how are you going to get me to know that it's out there? Tree falls in the woods. You don't see it fall in the woods, then you don't know that it fell. Somebody makes a great skill, action, capsule, whatever, and you don't know that it's there, let alone know how to use it. So that, to me, is a function of marketing, which the marketing, the marketing has to be built into from the very beginning of any creation of any one of these skills, actions, capsules, has to be done in the beginning. And if it's not done in the beginning, if you get three quarters of the way through and say all of a sudden I've got to market this product to let people know that it's out there, then you've lost the game. And the second side of that is if you market too hard and the product causes any problems and people drop it, then you've really screwed your brand. Yeah, and I think that user experience piece of it is really, really important. Um, and I don't know how many people noticed that the timing of this was, was uh, not uh, coincidental, but uh, this week Pandora announced uh, their voice uh, service that's a part of the, uh, the app now. And we spent a lot of time taking a look at the context, you know, when people are listening to music to make it be really natural. You know, say, play me something I like, or I don't like that. Oh, I like that. Play me something chill. Let me, you know, so, so kind of figuring out what are these very natural responses so that you're not having to relearn uh, a system. And then the other thing that's also important for us is we have ads that have voice activation as well. So looking at how you're building that into the ad for our advertisers so that you can interact with ads using your voice too. Um, and again, that kind of goes back to what I was saying earlier thinking about it as part of a, of a system, uh, as, as opposed to just, oh, voices in a silo. Mm -hmm. so. One thing just to, to add to that, it's a great point about doing things that are natural to the user. We don't know what those are yet, right? These are such early sure. days, and you know, yeah. only we're all here trying to learn together about what makes good experience for, for voice, and there's not these white papers and years and years of research right, that we can build on. We're all figuring this out together. So, Doing, you know, getting in there and doing that research is so important, yeah. not just in the context of your own products, but trying to understand the platforms and how people use them, how people of different ages use them. So that, that's a challenge in and of itself, not having that history to rely on. Yeah, and I think the sort of first step is that we take what is kind of linear content and we put it out there using commands, using menus uh, with voice. But you know, we're definitely moving to a place where the content is not necessarily just linear, it's multi-linear. It's something that you achieve through agency while you travel a path with your voice in a conversation. And that's a completely different thing. That's kind of separate from print culture even, right? Yeah. Yeah, the voice as it develops, it's forcing, um, by the nature of it, completely different media forms. Um, it changes the cadence of telling a story, if storytelling is what you do. Can you talk, any of you, can you talk a little bit about um, ways that you would traditionally get your media across to an audience, how that's different, what kind of challenges you have to tackle to get that message through to your audience when it's a voice? I'll start. Um, I think 
I like to say that I feel like we're in the golden age of entertainment. There's never been before so much content to watch and then so many ways to watch it. I feel like I can spend hours at night just trying to pick a new series to watch, um, which is a really exciting place to be in, but it's also, um, it also causes a customer problem, frankly. Customers are faced with tons of complexity and choice, and they, they just want to watch something, but it's really hard to find it. Um, so I, I think that voice is a fantastic way to solve that problem. Um, it's a great way to, customers don't want to have to remember if content's on Netflix or HBO or it's live on TV. They just want to say a voice command and get right into that content. Um, so I think, that, I think that voice is a fantastic way to solve that problem today and it's really, um, uh, it's, it's, it's a reason why customers love it and want to continue using it. You know, I think that um, as the uh, proliferation of the visual devices, so the Sh Amazon Show 5, that sort of thing, increase as a result of especially the cost of it of just a, about a week ago when the cost went way down and the numbers went way up in terms of sales and the penetration of the devices, that's going to make a, a big difference in, in how people operate. But I totally agree with you. I think that the, in, in terms of navigation of uh, entertainment content, whether it's video or audio, whether it's music or television or movies, the idea is absolutely, I want to see movies that, that star Jason Statham. And then the list comes up. And you can see the list if it's a video thing. If it's a, spe a specific request, you should be able to just go to it regardless of what services you have. When I'm at home, I've got, uh, I must have five different OTT devices plugged into the back of my TV, let alone the BBC, which I'm getting, or ITN, or all the other, because I'm, I'm from England, all the other stuff uh, that I get. I want to be able to just say, show me something and have it determine through all of those five or six systems where the best place is for that. And I also don't want to have to pay for it beyond what I've already paid. So that means that there needs to be a monetization factor built into that, uh, into that skill. And you have to deal with that, obviously, a lot with, with, in terms of rights and clearances. Sure, yeah, I mean, that, that's, that's part of the whole business model that you have to, to work around. Um, I, I also think that um, you know, there's, there's something to be said for uh, how the technology is impacting our behavior um, and paying attention to that as well. You know, I, I could see in the foreseeable future um, you know, walking into maybe a connected home and not having to ask because facial recognition has already decided what my emotional state is. And so it's creating a mood congruent environment by changing the colors and putting things out there. And, and so, you know, I, I, I think from a psychological perspective, again, this is what's really fascinating to me, is what are we doing and what biases are we now you know, building into these systems in new ways, and and that's the fascinating topic. Or, or what me. neuroscience sure. uh, is, in, how does neuroscience impact the use of it? Yeah. Well, I, I think tied into all this is the idea that we've lived in a culture of print and authorship for a very long time where, you know, the, there's a curation and a linear, you know, output, and what we're seeing is now that it's a conversation, there's agency on the part of the experiencer. They get a control, and so there's a destabilizing effect to that. And you're right; I think it's there's no immediate answers. We don't know what's going to happen, but I think the, the idea is that embracing it and learning how to create in a new kind of a, in a new medium and a new way of thinking is, is the way forward, right? Yeah. Courtney, uh, let me ask you a question. Um, at the New York Times, you are uh, a messenger of journalism. How does voice, I know in some of your research you've uncovered interesting things about the way that uh, news consumers perceive um, voice and also how to deliver journalism over voice. What are some of the things you've learned at the Times? Yeah, um, so last year we actually did um, about three months of infield user research, um, kind of exploring how people were using smart speakers. And so I think, you know, just going to your question about like how do we have to think about content differently, is that something that we realized is just doing some really early prototyping, just doing something like taking text to speech 
We realize that articles aren't the same things as stories. Um, that basically, when people are like trained to hear something, they're trained to hear something that has like a very clear beginning, middle, and end. And the way a lot of our articles are structured, that's not necessarily the case. It's actually picking up on what happened the day before. It's kind of jumping in the middle of things. So we've had to learn a lot about that this is actually a medium that's very different and it needs to be treated as such. We're not just taking existing content that we have and putting it on these platforms. Um, but, a, but the other thing that we learned is one of the questions that we asked is, you know, we saw that people were personifying the devices, you know, referring to Alexa as her, referring to um, the Google Assistant as her um, as well. And so one of the questions that we asked uh, was, you know, how would you describe Alexa or your, your Echo or your Google Home? Expecting that people would assign personality attributes, but actually, um, of the 25 people that we interviewed, uh, almost everyone assigned race as well and said that the devices, um, they imagined the devices being white. And so as we think about um, trying to be more inclusive about our journalism, we actually need to think about if we're using these devices to get content out there, how is that being filtered and how is that potentially altering people's perceptions of the content as well? So it's something that we're thinking really critically about because you know, we want to make sure that our audience um, feels included and considered. Yeah. yeah, when there's the conversations around biases as we develop voice, often I feel like a lot of those conversations are on the hardware level. Where, how Amazon or Google is approaching their own biases in building artificial intelligence. But it's also from the content creator or um, product producer's side. Do you guys have any other um, insights about how you realized you needed to address preconceived notions? This happened to us from the Nickelodeon side in terms of how kids approach devices, right? So that's obviously, you know, we have preconceived notions as adults building skills or actions in terms of uh, you know, how we might interact with it, right? the assumptions that we make about what someone might want to say, that's obviously going to be very different for a young kid. So we've had to sort of deal with that and, and change that a little bit. And I've seen that myself a little bit with my kids in terms of how they interact with it. So going from everything from two-year-olds up through you know, pre-K that we deal with on the Nickelodeon side um, through older kids, it's all very different in trying to deal with that all the way through the, the MTV audience and the older audience and trying to be be mindful that there's not a one-size-fits-all solution. The conversational styles have to be different when you're dealing with different, different age groups. Yeah, it's interesting for us because, I mentioned this before, we, because we have the largest screen in front of the user, um, we, we tend to just steer away from too much personality. Um, we're really, our objective is to get the user to the, the content that they want on our platform as quickly as possible and get out of their way. And so, we tend to not do conversation as much as possible. Um, if we are doing any response back to the user after they issue a voice command, we, we actually see it as a failure in our natural language processing and machine learning. We think that we should be good enough at getting the user directly to where they want to go. Um, an example, actually this is probably relevant to you, um, the CW just launched Pandora, and um, it, uh, it's a, a popular series right now. We also have Pandora, the app, on our platform. And so right now, we, um, because we have both of these, these, um, these uh, icons on our platform, if a user says Pandora, we surface both. But I think um, ultimately we want to get to a place where we can use um, more information to help inform how we're surfacing that result. Um, so if we know the user's been binging Pandora, just, and they say Pandora, just get them right there. Mm -hmm. And then if we know they're an avid uh, Pandora app user, they, they listen to a lot of music on our platform, and they say a voice command, we just get them right there as well. So um, it's really for us about getting to the content, getting out of the way as much as possible, and using machine learning to, to achieve that. Yeah, I think, again, because I always approach everything through the lens of psychology, you know, the, this, this idea that we are able with data to be able to know Usually at this point of time in the day, here's what this individual is doing. You know, I mean, we can ping mobile phones. I say we, I don't mean Pandora. Uh, but you know, the, the technology's there so that we can know whether you're male or female based on how you're walking and how your phone's moving. Um, so, you know, what concerns me with, with voice is when we think about these biases and the idea, particularly when it's related to news, does the voice that delivers the news have a bearing on how I, as a listener, accept it and remember it? 
And if I know that maybe by playing into a bias, my message can get received, and then I'm able to target a particular voice so that that listener is more apt to believe what I'm telling them, now we're getting into a world where sonic propaganda is quite possible. <laughs> you know, and, and, and it will happen. It's happening. You know? Yeah, it's happening now. So, and, and to me, those are, the, those are the more fascinating questions. I absolutely agreed. And what, it, what you're talking about is, is sort of the seat of authority. Yeah. Right? And, and I think, again, as content it becomes a little more diversified in terms of the agency of the user, as the person can choose their way through their entertainment, that, again, deceits that authority and it makes it a little bit more democratic in a way. Right. But it's also, again, there are converse concerns about that, right? Yeah. I keep wondering what would happen if every ad I heard, I heard it in my own voice. <laughs> Um, well, that's that, and, and, and that can happen. Yes, you know? well, and that's actually probably easy to have. I think <laughs> that, we get back to this, this question has, has been around for as long as there has been the opportunity for someone to record a voice and use that recorded voice to tell a story. Mm -hmm. So whether it's I need to do a voiceover with somebody because I'm making a commercial or I'm doing a voiceover of a news piece that I put together, the sound and the quality of the voice, and, and at some point back in the day they started to call it the voice of God, and does that voice of God bring enough credibility uh, to the sound of whatever that story is? Will that make you understand that story any better? And I actually think the answer to that question is yes. And that is a matter of figuring out what is that voice, how does that fit into your own bias, and what does it make you think when you hear it? This is gonna be an AI fix at some point, not yet, but it's gonna be an AI fix because it's an absolute fact that the sound that you're hearing is going to influence your thought process, 100%. To, to take that maybe one level down from you know, bi uh, news, news bias, we think about that from a media perspective in terms of, you mentioned the voice of God, using those same voices that you would have on Comedy Central doing, doing your ads or doing your, your hits, using that within our Comedy Central skills, right? Or for our VMA voting skill for MTV, making sure that the same voice of God from the VMA show is exactly the same as who's doing the MTV voting, VMA voting skill, because that's a sense of authority and, and genuineness, right? That this is, it's really the same thing, right? That the brand is really aligned through this process. And you've, you've in your thought process, made the decision that you want to have this uniformity across these platforms so that there is an understanding of that that's the voice that, that you need to be listening to. Right, the most important thing, the authority is, is the brand, yep. right? It's not as important, and we try and, we work with our brand design teams to make sure that we're thinking about linear TV and apps and websites and voice all at the same time. So that's being designed across platforms in a truly multimodal way from the beginning and getting in there and being part of that conversation. And, Talk and of, I'm curious to so your, your perspectives on the value of synthetic voice in the products that you make versus human voice. At the New York Times, you know, on the Daily, the host of the Daily, his voice is part of that yeah. experience. For, for, for Courtney and for everyone, talk a little bit about synthetic voices and human voices and the use of them. Yeah, I mean, we've been doing a lot of prototyping with this, and I think that what we found is that people still want a person to tell them a story. Um, that as much as um, the assistance can be incredibly helpful as far as, you know, if you need to ask for completion of a task, it's great, you know, to ask Alexa or to ask Google or to ask Siri to do that. But when it comes to actually delivering something like the news, diving into the stories about, you know, things like immigration or what's, I'm actually impressed, maybe some of you on your computers are watching Mueller testify right now. Right. Um, when it comes to things like that, um, you actually still, what we found from our research is that people still want a person that's delivering that information to them. Because, I mean, you're right, when you talk about things like biases, is that, there's so much human connection that comes from that. Um, I think where you know we saw a lot of people feeling overwhelmed by the cadence and um, like tenor of the news as it stands right now, feeling like they're overwhelmed by how negative it was. Is that audio was a bright spot in that? Is that it felt people felt like they could actually connect to really complicated sub subject matter. They were willing to go deeper on um, complicated subject matter, and so we want to make sure that we're actually like leading with something that's working right now um, when we're especially in a moment where people could be experiencing news fatigue? I think that um, you know, there's, there's a couple of things to think about here. In, in news, you don't particularly want to have an emotional sound. 
you want it to be a sound that you can listen to and make your own decisions about. At least that's uh, other, other than, say, Fox News. That's pretty much what everybody else does. Um, the, the idea, though, that, um, that recorded voices offer a lot of positives. So they offer uh, a, an emotion. They offer a, a dynamic. They offer you something that a non-recorded voice doesn't necessarily offer you yet. Because I think at some point, AI and uh, non-recorded voices will start to sound more and more human. I think uh, that do the, the, there's a couple of, uh, of apps out there and, uh, that, are, that are starting to do that. But I heard yesterday something I thought was very interesting. I heard it from Vixen and I heard it from Rain about how they're, they're, they're utilizing the combination of the AI to navigate you into an area where the natural sounding recorded voice is now taking over. So it's a sort of a two-step process that takes advantage of those two things that voice absolutely has uh, control of. And, and what you're talking about there is kind of what I mentioned at the beginning. It's we're running into issues of scale. It's, uh, you know, uh, we know how to scale in other media. We know how to scale in, uh, you, know, it, you know, entertainment, publishing, news, all that. But then how do you scale it? And, and what you just described is one possible solution where the, the assistant is like the concierge, right? The, who comes in and says, okay, we're gonna give you uh, a, a way of understanding what the front page is and you wanna turn to this section or turn to that yeah. section. But I think also we're, we're going to see, and, and I'm not sure how far into the future this is, I think we're going to see where uh, there's not just a two minute interview, but the person who's going into it gets to decide the topics that they want to interview the interviewee about. <laughs> Uh, where they can maneuver through and at any moment say, oh, I want to hear the biography of the person who you just, you just call that out and go right to it and come back. That's, I think, where we get into a place that, that scale is even harder. <laughs> well, that requires a lot of work on the part of the people who are yeah. putting the stuff in exactly. so that there's a tag that says, okay, here's where the biography begins and ends. Here's yeah. where this story begins and ends. Here's where this story begins and ends. And those are triggers that will be activated by your voice. Exactly. Steve, something that he brought up was this idea of a future where there are contextualized and personalized responses that, his example, you can walk into a room and facial recognition will know who you are. That's, that's far out in the future. But I'm curious, especially the people that work on products, like Leela, um, as you think about a future where there are more, where, for example, you don't have to pick up the remote and touch the button, where there's more contextualized and personalized, like what, how does Comcast think about that down the line, approaching that? Yeah, so I think um, voice is a fantastic way to discover content, um, and I think I think that we can continue to evolve the product to really develop some unique experience there, experiences there for discovery. Um, I think, like for example, we have a voice command, or we help customers find content by saying things like "Show me the episode of Friends with Brad Pitt," because um, you just can't remember you know, where that episode is and you just want to say it and we do all the machine learning in the back end. Um, I think that there's massive opportunity for us to figure out how to better personalize the experience. So I can say things like, show me movies about dogs that I haven't seen before. Um, one of our challenges though with those types of commands is that um, we actually, we don't know who's in front of the TV. We know who's talking into the product, but we don't know everybody there. Oftentimes you're watching TV with your yeah. family. Yeah, no, I agree. That's why I'm saying I think this is a big opportunity for us. I think, um, it, and then if we can take, we know, you've seen the, we know you've seen the movie, but I haven't seen it. We want to take that into account when surfacing the result. Um, I think that'll be really, really powerful to deliver some really personalized experiences that, um, that really um, support your whole family. Mark, is this something that you guys are thinking about on the on the edge of your development? We're thinking about it in terms of platform capabilities. I think we're really big believers in this sort of zero distance that's gonna, that voice can help create. You talked about literally putting down the remote. So being on platforms where you know we're, we're doing a lot right now with making sure if you have an Alexa paired with a Fire TV or your Fire TV cube, that if you say, I wanna watch, Alexa, I wanna watch Love and Hip Hop, VH1's Love and Hip Hop comes up right away. So we want to make sure as the platforms evolve to that, we're really bullish on that capability that our content is there along for the ride. I mean, if you think about AirPods, right, that's just another way of creating zero distance. I go outside, I just pop them in right away, right? So it's zero distance between myself and a set of audio content. So that's going to continue to evolve to a point where as content creators, we want to make sure we're there on those platforms. And what about the challenges and possibilities as voice becomes more all-inclusive of your devices as those things are interconnected 
and starts to know where you are and can follow you along throughout your day. How, is that something that you think about too as, as you develop products? Yeah, I think that's probably a little a little farther <laughs> off. Uh, right. So we're thinking a, li a little bit closer horizon horizon than that. But it's part of what excites us about it. So I, I think all these um, this whole evolution, it, there's going to be more and more voice input into a lot of different types of content, right? So you think about voice specifically as input for a variety of things. Part of what excites us about the entire platform. I think that um, you're in an, actually I think a pretty unique situation. Correct me if I'm wrong. From those of you who are in the big companies still. <laughs> Um, in that your company sees it as, a, as an important enough technological advancement to create a situation where you and your job inside a company as big as Viacom can concentrate on voice. I, and yeah. I, don't, I don't think that every big company out there is doing that yet. I think that they have to get there um, in order to make what it is that we're talking about up here something that will be accessible and ready and usable and thought out to everyone in this room or ev everyone out there because a couple of things come, in, come to mind. A paywall comes to mind. Where, what, what problems do paywalls uh, create? Certainly in the New York Times, the geographic location and paywall combined creates a problem. And I think what ends up happening is that you know, you want this to be something that is there for you when you want it, make it easy, all of a sudden, I gotta worry about a paywall, all of a sudden, oh man, I can't get this because I just took a flight to England. All of that stuff has to be figured out too because those are the kinds of things that will kill this before it helps it. Yeah. John, you're developing software for a variety of people trying to approach a variety of needs. How does monetization fit into what, they're, what you're seeing? That's a good question. Um, yeah, I think it depends on you know, what, what the content is. Different content will, you know, obviously monetize in different ways. I think we're also running into this uh, situation where advertising is not really a part of voice. Right. The same way, and I think that's, in some ways, a little bit inhibiting, right? Um, it, 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 or at least it's forcing us to think about things in very different ways. Um, I think that one of the ways that monetization is going to come along, it, it kind of piggybacks off of what you were saying, this idea that you should be able to have it when you want it, wherever you want it, whatever device, the same way that you can log into a browser here and a browser there and a browser there, that's just not possible right now and I think it's a technological limitation. It's something that we're thinking very, very carefully about with our back-end technology and I think that, that that sort of operability in between the different services is, is something that could cause a breakthrough that enables people to want to sign up and say, I will pay for this because I know I can get it anywhere. Yeah. What about... Um as consumers are becoming better educated about voice technology, as it becomes more pervasive, this is all happening at the same time where there are heightened privacy concerns, not necessarily in voice, but I think it spills over into that. You know, when you're talking about walking into your house and your face being recognized and knowing who you are, are you, where do you think consumers are in terms of excitement about voice technology and also nervousness about it listening to everything that you're saying? I can jump in. I think, um, I mean, we saw a lot of like tension between adoption and intrusion. Um, so we saw that people were, you know, there's really low barriers to entry with like buying these devices. Um, you know, you can buy one um, fairly cheaply. So we saw that people were eager to try it out, but then we saw them kind of negotiating, um, especially within their families, like where it was going to show up in their home. Like, we'll buy it, but I won't put it in our bedroom. Um, and so I think that that's something that like is definitely a concern um, where people are like wondering about these devices, devices listening to them. But I think that the other thing that we saw that actually, um, at least in our research, that outweighed even the privacy concerns um, were concerns just about you know amounts of technology that people were being exposed to. And I think that was actually one of the benefits. Um, that people saw a voice, at least without the devices without screens, is that this is a pull mechanism. They feel like all of their devices are constantly pushing information at them with like notifications. And so I think it was more like uh, where what we saw is like concerns about privacy, but also just concerns about health of technology as well, and being inundated with information and content all the time, and really wanting to, really using these devices as a way to kind of take a break actually from their phones, which was powerful. So I think all of that kind of worked together. We're like, I might be concerned that this device is listening to me, but it's getting me off my phone. So I'm actually OK with, um, with that trade-off. What about the rest? Have you guys seen manifestations of consumer hesitancy versus consumer Absolutely. Excitement? Yeah. Yeah. I, 
Well, a couple of, couple of things come to mind. First of all is anyone who thinks there's security out there anyway is crazy because there is no security. <laughs> and, it, and so go into it knowing that and then start to use the, the tool the way that you want to use the tool. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, because I, I know a couple of people, my wife is a really good example of this, that, um, that she gets frustrated with it. Then she'll say, I don't want it listening to me. And I imagine uh, that a lot of people have issues with that at their homes. Um, I particularly, my issue manifested itself in my equipment being ripped out of the wall and left in the middle of my living room floor when I came home. And I said, well, what is that doing there? And the answer was, because I don't want it listening to me anymore. And you weren't here to, to stop it from talking because someone on a TV said the word Alexa and every device in my house went off. So no, there's a lot of concern out there about that. Yeah, and I, and I think the thing is, it's a, uh, in terms of the concern about voice assistants and the being reported, it's a dis, uh, um, it's a difference in perception, not in severity. They, you know, <laughs> privacy is a concern just in general right yeah. now. And I think you know the what's the face app face app situation is a perfect example of everyone immediately giving up a lot of privacy, uh, you know, just on a whim. And I think that would be much more concerning. And I when I saw that happen, I thought, wow, that's much more of a concern. Than, yeah, but you know, th that's some, yeah, interesting. Yeah. But listen, the people people were told. Do yes. not use this app, it, and people perception. continued to use yeah. the app. Yeah. And well, the other element to it is, the terms of service of Face app weren't all that different than just garden variety terms of service. No, it looked for, like anything else that yeah. you would have gone to and used. But who knew going to it, going to it, and using it meant that you were sending information to the Russians? <laughs> and who I, knew that? And I think that's the, the reality. Is is that for all of us scared about the privacy concerns, at the end of the day, we'll sell our souls really quickly. Um, yeah. You know, for, for, for whatever we can get. Um, and, for, and, for a free yeah. song. And, and I'm like, I don't have a device in my home for the same reason. My beloved is like, I don't want it listening. You know, and I, and I think with voice, this is an interesting thing because, you know, there is this idea of, of eavesdropping which for us psychologically is really different than I'm typing something into my computer and the exact same thing is happening. Somebody's eavesdropping on the text. But we don't think about that as personally as voice. So from a psychological perspective, there's a shattering of intimacy mm -hmm. there that I think is gonna take a little while, but as soon as, as soon as we start developing the emotional connections with the voice and it becomes more of a relationship than any other device we have, um, which there's already research about those kinds of things that are happening, we'll, we'll get over it. You know, we'll, we'll get to a point where it's not going to matter, sadly, but yeah. that's, the, that's just the yeah. yeah, that's history. We'll all get over it. Yeah. Well, I think what's disconcerting is that the, the boundary between what is public and what is private has just shrunk in quite a bit as digital revolution, voice revolution, and, and that's the uncomfortability, right? Is, oh my gosh, the stuff that I thought was private is not really private anymore. It's actually public. Do, do you think there's an uncanny valley with voice? Because I, I'm, I wonder if there really is, because AI get, getting to a point where you're not going to be able to tell, but is that going to freak you out as much as if you met an android and you couldn't tell whether it was human or not? When I came are we back just going to accept that? When I came back from it, the Matrix nice last that. night, <laughs> I thought... <laughs> Sorry. No, no, no. No, <laughs> no I think we're going to accept it. I, I just think that it's, it's, you know, everything that we've seen and everything that we've learned, we get to that point, it's always been like that. It doesn't really matter. I think there were issues back in the, you know, in the early days of communication. I mean, I'm not talking about smoke signals. I'm talking about once there was, I'm talking about how does voice interact with media. So what is media? Media is print, media is television, media is radio, media is at live uh, performance. And all of these things depend on one thing in common, everything, especially new media in, in print. I was gonna say everything is, it's voice, it's sound. It's about sound, especially in what you're doing uh, in, in print, uh, in print in the voice space. It's about sound. Everybody deals with sound, except for people who can't hear. Uh, and there are people who are working on systems right now that will work for those people as well. I just want to take one moment. We only have a few minutes left, and I want to give you, the audience, the opportunity if you have any questions, brief questions. Um, I think the easiest way to do it would, if you have a question, just come up here 
by the side of stage and I can walk down, we can take the question. But um, as you formulate those thoughts, if you want to come down. Um, this, is a, this has a little to do with what we were just discussing. Um, kids and boys, can you guys talk a little bit about, not necessarily the privacy implications, but the fact that there are generations, my daughter included, where speaking to a technological product is more natural than using a phone. So, oh, well, good. No, well, it, I think it's it's very telling that you know I've heard from a lot of people that uh, their child's first word is now Alexa. It's coming up. It happens. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I and I think that you know it's it's really interesting. It's the same as when one user interface was dominant and then another came along. The younger generation always just picks up on it like it's natural. And I think that's definitely happening. Now, you know, in terms of uh, whether or not there's any concerns, I think that that you know. We all need to understand what the perception of, perception is of what privacy is, as we were discussing. And I think that there's a lot of discussion to be had and a lot of lawmaking to be had to understand, like, how, how do we operate in this new world, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, one thing that I'll say is just, like, and it's pretty obvious, is that kids are power users of these devices. Um, and I think that because discovery is a challenge, is that what we saw is that kids just have more patience to play around with it and actually no, discover what it can do. Okay. So I think that, um, you know, there are certainly the concerns that, like, that you mentioned, but I think that um, as far as them kind of adapting to it, it's not just necessarily that it's inherent. They just actually, frankly, I think, have a lot more patience than, in, than adults when the device gets something wrong. It's, it's one of the reasons you know, we think about this investment that you mentioned from a Viacom perspective. We know there's so many kids growing up with this being their first, one of their first true technologies that they've really mastered. So imagine what's going to happen in 10 years when those you know, preteens or teens are getting their phones and dealing with these devices on their own. right? So we want to be there now so that we can grow along with them and learn along with them to have the right, um, right media, right experiences for those what will be power users. I'm going to get to our questions over here. I think the best way is, do you want to just come up? Oh, you have a mic. Hello. Never mind. My question was for Courtney. Um, a big part of reading the Times for me is the comment section. I think in the app that adds so much depth to the stories. And so my question for you is, how do you think about bringing the voices of your readers and listeners to your audio experiences? It's something that we've been thinking a lot about because actually it's where we actually run into privacy concerns. So like, how do we actually make sure, I mean, that we're being considered about the comments that people are, are making, but not necessarily creating a scenario in which like we're violating the privacy of, you know, seeing the like responses and intents or something like that that people are providing. So um, I don't necessarily have a firm answer right now because it's something that we're like continuing to prototype, but I think um, our comments is, it's an area of uh, the New York Times that we put a lot of effort into developing like a really great and thoughtful community. So it's something that we do want to replicate. I think we're just looking right now at the right ways that we're respecting people's privacy, but also um, respecting, you know, who those people are and the ways we might want to bring their voices to life that do them justice as well, like whether it's actually using an Alexa or Google Voice or are we getting people to voice those over. I think a lot of that is how we're kind of approaching some of our upcoming audio content too. What are the privacy considerations with comments? I've, I, I don't well, know. just that, um, you know, right now, like what we can see, like if people are interacting with the devices, like we can see, you know, what someone's response might be to a certain like intent that we have, um, but that's not necessarily something that we want to share. That's not necessarily something that people are offering up. Um, and so we would actually love to think about how we could maybe um, use those things in the future, but we want to make sure that it's not a situation, you know, if people feel like these devices are listening in, we've got to be like very, very careful about how we approach that and look for that input. Good morning. I'm Navya. From, I'm a product manager at Kinect. Uh, I have a question for the panel. So with your, during your experiments with uh, synthetic voice, did you notice uh, uh, any difference with the, between the younger and older generations connecting uh, on a human level with human versus synthetic voices? So I think the question was, have, has our panel noticed differences for audience members connecting with a human voice versus a synthetic voice? Is that correct? Yes, okay. with older versus younger generations. I, I think part, part of that, I mean, 
Yeah, I, I think we mentioned some of that before, but Speaking. especially coming from where we come from with brands, we feel there's a connection already built into those brands, into a Comedy Central or an MTV or a Nickelodeon. So we want to make sure the voices of those brands come to life on a voice platform, right? So we, we almost never use text-to-speech. I think it's always recorded voice in some, in some way because it's just going to feel more personal and really come to life. And that's what our research has shown. And I think we've seen other third-party research to that end as well. One last question. Hi, I'm Heidi Cohen of the Actionable Marketing Guide. And my question is directed to Courtney. You talked about the research that the New York Times Digital did. I was wondering if that is available publicly or if there's some way we could get a hold of it. Or if, also if any other members of the panel yeah, have that we're actually kind of making, data. Uh, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off. We're actually making a lot of that available on our Times Open blog. Um, so we also participated, um, the Reuters Institute actually did a pretty great comprehensive um, voice survey last year. And we participated and actually offered up a lot of our research um, for that um, report that they put out as well. So. Um, there's upcoming um, voice uh, research that will be available, but we also um, participated in that report, which I have to say was really impressive and very comprehensive and encompasses not just the research that we did, but other news organizations did as well. Well, thank you to our panel, and thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Thanks to Joan Salzman from CNET for hosting our fabulous panel. Come on, let's see if we can do better than that. I know we're getting on. Thank you very much. Thank you all very much for joining us this morning.